Hello, it is 5 a.m. in Washington. It's midday in Jerusalem. I'm Monita Rajpal. You're watching World One. Live we begin this hour in Washington, where Israel's prime minister will meet the U.S. president today for what's expected to be a tense round of talks. Benjamin Netanyahu arrives less than 24 hours after Barack Obama delivered a big speech on U.S. relations with the Middle East. As Jill Doherty explains, a lot of what Mr. Obama said got a frosty reception in Israel. It's an idea the U.S. has supported unofficially for years, but no president has ever before stated it as policy. President Obama's speech didn't go down well with many Palestinians either. Hamas, the party that won the last Palestinian elections, described his remarks as empty of concrete significance. Let's bring in Kevin Flower, who joins us now live from Jerusalem. Kevin, uh, there's also the questions that Palestinians are asking. Are, okay, the, Mr. Obama has said all these things that he wants for the region, but there were probably wondering and I'm assuming what kind of role the Americans actually want to play in this. Well, one thing to remember in all of this talk about what Obama laid out in his speech is that all of that is predicated on talks taking place at some time in the future. But the reality on the ground here, Monita, is that talks have not been going on between the Palestinians and the Israelis for months. Well, historically, and at the center of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, the West Bank was part of the British mandate of Palestine in 1920. After Israel was established, Jordan annexed the West Bank in 1950. It was then captured by Israel in the 1967 Six Day War. In 2002, the Israelis began building a wall separating the West Bank from Israel. The West Bank's population is now estimated at 2.4 million, and that includes about 780,000 Palestinians. Palestinian refugees and about 300,000 Israelis. The Israeli settlements are deemed illegal under international law, but Israel disputes this. In New York this Friday, Dominique Strauss-Kahn exchanges his prison cell for a Manhattan apartment and house arrest. The former head of the International Monetary Fund expects to be released from Rikers Island jail in the coming hours. Khan had been seen as a contender for president of France when elections are held next year. CNN's Ivan Watson has been monitoring reaction in Paris. He joins us now live from the French capital. And Ivan, as I was watching the, uh, the, what was happening in the courtroom in uh, New York yesterday when both sides were talking about whether or not to grant um, uh, Strauss-Kahn bail, I was just curious as to know how the French were viewing all of this and whether or not Strauss-Kahn's friends may be distancing themselves at this point there in Paris. Well, what's interesting is for the first time late last night, uh, the French president, Nicolas Sarkozy... A car bomb has exploded in northwest Pakistan, killing at least one person and injuring 11 others. Police and Peshawar say the attack was aimed at U.S. consulate vehicles. Let's bring in CNN Stan Grant, who's following developments from CNN Islamabad. Stan. Yeah, Manita, you mentioned the consular vehicles. We've been in contact with police in Peshawar, and they say there were three vehicles. The state of Mississippi has reported its first loss of life in the current record floods. A 69-year-old man drowned as high waters swept through the city of Vicksburg. The Mississippi River there has swollen to four meters above flood stage. Businesses in Tunica in the north of the state are starting to reopen, but others remain at the mercy of the water. One of them is a century-old family business in the historic town of Natchez. And as CNN's David Mattingly reports, they've chosen not to flee, but fight. Standing on right here. Fighting the Mississippi is a game of inches. How far out can you go that's safe? Worry and, and wait, and the waiting game continues. Let's go to our meteorologist, Ivan Cabrera, at the World Weather Center with more. Ivan. So the river is uh, rising, has been rising, right? We're cresting in some areas, but it has also, as uh, it has risen, expanded here in geography. It's just uh, amazing at uh, what it's done. I'll share Ivan, the Ivan, thank map. you very much. Here are some of the stories we're talking about this hour. He'll be back, just not quite yet. Arnold Schwarzenegger has put his Hollywood uh, comeback on hold so he can focus on, quote, personal matters. The actor's announcement comes following revelations that he fathered a child with his former housekeeper. The former California governor had been planning to restart his acting career in the summer with a possible return to the Terminator franchise. If your Playboy collection was thrown away after your mom found it stashed under your bed, there's good news for you. You can all catch it again all online. Playboy is launching a web-based subscription service that lets you view every page of every magazine. That's almost 60 years worth. 
It's the brand's latest effort to combat sliding sales. Recent gimmicks have included a cover picture of cartoon character Marge Simpson. That's a little disturbing. And a centerfold shot in 3D with 3D glasses provided perhaps even more disturbing. She was defined by her love life, Jackie Kennedy, later Jackie Onassis, but uh, what was her love life before she met President-to-be John F. Kennedy? A woman in France has just paid more than $134,000 to find out. That was the winning bid for 22 love letters Jackie Kennedy Onassis sent to her then-boyfriend when she was a teenager. The last of the letters informed him that she was engaged to someone else. You're watching World One and Life provide a guarantee for another five million. We want to get more now on those bail conditions. CNN's Emily Rubin joins us now in the studio, and those conditions are, are quite extraordinary. They are pretty extraordinary, and given that the judge said that Strauss Kahn was a serious risk of flight, he still guaranteed him bail, and I think it's because those conditions were so strict. And in fact, the conditions were recommended by Strauss Kahn's own lawyers. Which is there was something to be, uh, there was talk about wearing an electronic tag. Is that supposed to happen as well? Well, yes. He's he's going to be under video surveillance and wear an electronic. A tag, yeah. um, and the judge did say, you know, we are worried about him being a, a, a flight risk, and Thank his you lawyer. Very much for that. Well, Dominic Strauss-Kahn's departure from the IMF leaves open a vacancy for one of the world's most powerful jobs. But who gets to choose? Richard Quest explains. The issue is very simple: who takes over? The IMF. A standing ovation for Queen Elizabeth in the capital of the Irish Republic. On the eve of her final day in Ireland, the audience rose and cheered when the Queen met performers after a gala concert in Bruce Dublin. Lee joins us now live from Dublin with a look at what's in store for the royal party's last day in Ireland. But more on that, uh, Vanula, more about the, the trip as a whole and the kind of, I guess, emotions and tone it has left, it is, it is leaving behind. Well, I think the, the Queen can leave the Republic of Ireland later today, secure in the knowledge that she has... The end of the world starts on Saturday. At least it does, according to Harold Camping. He is the head of a religious group that says Judgment Day will be upon us this weekend with a massive earthquake heralding the second coming of Jesus. Here is at Facebook.com slash W1 what they do if the world does end on Saturday. Let's go to Rich in California. He says, I would try as hard as possible to be kind to others. I do not believe this Saturday is going to be any more or less special than any other day. Yeah, good point. Let's go to Prajakta there in India. She says, I would be extremely happy if the world ends on the 21st of May because that is when my final exams usually start. And then Matovu there in, uh, he's a Ugandan but lives in Denmark, says, I'm not too scared as I watch out daily and try to keep away from big sins. All right. Well, this is World One, live from London. Let's take a look at what's trending on social media right now. At number three, one of the top trends on Twitter is an IPO, and that's because social media site for businesses and job seekers, LinkedIn, more than doubled its stock market price on its market debut on Thursday. The stock was priced at $45 a share. It opened at $83, quickly rising above $90, hit a high of $122.70, and then closed at 94.25. The company raised more than 350 million dollars in its stock offering, making it one of the largest tech IPOs since Google's in 2004. At number two, one of the top trends on Twitter is 23-year-old Brazilian soccer player Den. Denilson, who says he's leaving English uh, team Arsenal. Denilson says it's been the worst season of his career, and that he decided he'd leave eight months ago. And at number one, American cyclist uh, Tyler Hamilton is the second teammate of Lance Armstrong to accuse the seven-time Tour de France winner of using banned performance enhancing substances. Hamilton told CBS in 60 Minutes that he saw Armstrong inject EPO, uh, a hormone controlling red blood cell production. A few hours ago, Armstrong tweeted, 20 plus year career, 500 drug controls worldwide, in and out of competition, never a failed test. I rest my case. Well, the Armstrong story is big news in the U.S., where there's also a lot of attention on the NBA playoffs, of course. Dahmer Dell's here to tell us a little bit more 
about that. Absolutely, Manita. Thanks very much. Uh, it is now honors even in the NBA's Western Conference showdown between the Dallas Mavericks and Oklahoma City. The Thunder since Qatar won that uh, bid, Manita. Mm. That story has just gone on and on, hasn't it? No super injunction for them then. <laughs> no, absolutely no. not. All right, thank you very much for that, for that, Don. We'll explain about super injunction when we come back. Keep quiet or pay the price. Yeah, Britain's rich and famous are fighting for the right to hide their private lives, but have they suffered a major setback? Stay with us. Live from London, we are approaching almost 6 a.m. in New York, noon in Berlin, 7 p.m. in Tokyo. Talking about not talking. A British panel has published a major review of the power of the courts to gag the media. The growing use of so-called super injunctions has provoked concern. Injunctions have been issued to prevent uh, certain stories being reported. Bankers, sports celebrities and movie stars have all used them to kill inconvenient news items. But are things about to change? Well, CNN's Antika Schubert has been studying the judge's findings and joins us now. First of all, what is a super injunction? Well, a super injunction is like an injunction, barring, but except that not only can you not talk about the details of the case, you can't even discuss the fact that there is an injunction at all, mm. which has led to a lot of speculation as to who has actually requested and gotten a super injunction. But one of the interesting things about the report that came out today is that basically the top two justices in the country have said they have only found evidence of two super super injunctions actually being granted, which may come as a surprise to people. But again, there's been so much speculation because you simply can't talk about it. Yeah. And one you of the, can't even mention super injunctions. No, you can't. And But one of the interesting things, of course, is while the media can't talk about it, mm. that doesn't prevent the web from uh, Twitter to Facebook to whoever speculating on who, or, who may or may not have a super injunction and for what reason. Mm. And so there's been this imbalance that while the media can't say anything, social media is, is basically run rampant with it. Is there, are there questions about whether not the legal system would even allow something like this because injunctions have been used in the past to uh, either protect uh, certain victims in a case or certain uh, sensitive information when it comes to intelligence on terrorism related cases but when we're talking about someone uh, a footballer an athlete whatever it is a movie star having an affair with someone why would why would a judge grant an injunction on that well the chief justice made it clear this is about balancing uh, the right to privacy mm. and freedom of, of expression and information for the media and that there has to be some kind of a balance there. Uh, and so these injunctions have been applied for in the past successfully. The question is, how far have they gone? Should, should for example, is, is a super injunction simply too limiting, where you can't even talk about the fact that there is an injunction? Now, what this review has said is that when possible, journalists should be allowed in the court when that injunction is applied for, even if they can't report it mm. afterwards, so that at least they know that an injunction has been applied for. Um, and so that there is at least some form of open court there. Um, so there's going to be a lot of debate now about what use that's going to be if you can't report it afterwards. So there's still a lot of gray areas here. This is really just the beginning. All right. Atika, thank you very much for that. Atika Schubert here. This is World One, live from London. Just to recap our top stories for you. World One, one live from London. I'm Monita Rajpal. Thanks for joining us. Just before we go, I want to give you a look at these pictures. They're out of this world. This is Endeavour outside the International Space Station. Two of the astronauts have just gone out for a spacewalk. The news continues here on CNN.